John, it's a real pleasure to sit down with you. It's a pleasure to sit down with you, David. It's nice to uh, meet you in person. Yeah, it feels strange because we've spoken quite a few times online mm -hmm. uh, and I've obviously been following a lot of your work and especially the kind of journey that you've been on. So a way for people who don't know, uh, I think most people who watch the channel will kind of already be familiar with your work, but Awakening from the Meaning Crisis is now 40... 42 episodes. Yeah. 42 episodes, maybe 43 or 44 by the time this comes out. Yeah, probably, yes. Yeah, but... Um, what I find, what I'm really looking forward to exploring in this conversation is what comes next, because I know that you've got some really exciting and interesting ideas for what is going to happen next. I think so. But also what the journey has been like. Mm. Uh, and I'm reminded of a mutual friend of both of ours, Peter Lindbergh, talks about this kind of sending out mimetic artifacts yeah. into the world and seeing what comes back. Yeah. So we're sort of putting up a flag, we're putting our stuff out on YouTube, we don't know if anyone's going to watch it. We don't know if it's going to resonate with anyone, and then often it does. And I think, would you say that your work has resonated as well as you had hoped or expected? Or well, that's a that's a tricky question. Um, I'd hoped it resonated because, and I had some reason to believe it would in some ways, uh, because of the response to you know that material in in classrooms. And I had an earlier version, uh, you know, uh, Buddhism and Kog Sai, that course, and you know there was. And that, that had, a, had gotten a response beyond sort of what I had expected. Um, but it's been more than I've expected. It, it's, it, um, uh, it, it's um, I don't know what to say. It's a little bit intimidating at times. Um, I'll, get, uh, you know, I'll get email about people who are doing meetups and watching this series literally from all around the world. Uh, and um, that's been both very exciting and, and, and a, uh, you know, also a little bit like challenging um, because um, you know I take seriously my responsibility to my students and I'm not quite I'm sort of working out in my mind what's what is my what are my responsibilities now um, like for example just to give you a practical example I can't respond to every comment that comes uh, to every video that would be the last I, that would fill my days um, and I can't do that um, so but you know I can't I don't want to just ignore comments so I'm, 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 I'm very much in the process of trying to figure out what 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 can I with integrity do that you know is um, satisfying the responsibility I, I should have to people who are devoting? I understand this; they're devoting often considerable time and attention to trying to follow uh, the work I'm putting out. So that's some, that's very much a work in progress for me right now. For people who maybe you haven't been sort of following it closely, what's the overall frame? What's the elevator pitch for Awakening from the Meaning Crisis? So the elevator pitch for Awakening from the Meaning Crisis is the idea bringing together two sort of strands. One is an idea that, uh, 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 that human beings face perennial problems um, with their existence because of the centrality uh, to um, their existence of their ability to make meaning. So at the core of our cognition is our ability to make meaning. It's central to communication, problem solving, I would argue our intelligence, consciousness, etc. And then one of the main ideas is the very processes that makes our intelligence and that meaning making so adaptive also makes us perennially susceptible to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. So cultures across historical contexts, environmental contexts, have generally put together sets of practices um, uh, for intervening and helping to ameliorate some of these perennial problems of self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. And then what you need in addition to that is you need that, though, that set of practices to be homed within a worldview that legitimates them, valorizes, sets up traditions, sets up institutions, sets up communities, sets up, sets up exemplars, does all that paradigmatic work so that people know how to understand and judge and evaluate and pursue the cultivation of wisdom. And I'm, what I mean by wisdom is exactly those set of practices that help us to address um, the, the, uh, the problems of self-deception. The problem that's happened for us is that the worldview within which our wisdom traditions arose has been significantly undermined for a host of very inter interconnected and complex historical reasons that have to do with things like the Protestant Reformation, the emergence of the scientific worldview, um, uh, the movements in uh, the separation of philosophy uh, from a, a transformative set of practices 
unlike what it was in the ancient world with Socrates or Plato. Uh, we get the loss of wisdom institutions like the, the, the monastic tradition within the West is destroyed uh, because of the Protestant Reformation. So for a whole host of historical reasons, we have a worldview in which we as meaning makers don't belong. And then we also, and that worldview also doesn't tell, it tells us how to get information. And even if, right, even if you, um, if you want to give sort of a broad reading to science, it tells us how to get knowledge, but it really doesn't tell us how to cultivate wisdom. Again, not meaning just some lofty ideal. It's like, no, no, it's, you know, how things, how these problems sink their teeth into people's lives and shred them. And, and, and so what's happening is we don't have a worldview that homes, uh, even educates, guides. There's none of that paradigmatic homing for these practices. And so people are bereft. They don't know where to go for wisdom. They pursue it often in an autodidactic manner. They form, right, they form sort of pseudo-religious responses to try and do the work that has been lost. And so I won't get into all of the symptomology, but there's all of these different things that you can see happening that are a response to this. So what the series is, is a, 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 a historical analysis of how we lost that valorizing worldview and then a, a cognitive scientific analysis about what is the meaning-making machinery? What is self-deception? What are higher states of consciousness? What is enlightenment? What is wisdom? What's our best cognitive scientific answer of that? And then can we use that to create what I call psychotechnologies and communities and ecologies of them that can give us back the cultivation of wisdom and self-transcendence and also connect us up to a worldview that valorizes homes, legitimates and makes sense of that set of practices. So that's what the series is all about. And I guess just tying together that and the, the idea of sort of putting, putting this out as a kind of mimetic transmission, I know you've connected with other people who are asking those kind of questions. Oh, very much. Yeah. And what do you sense um, the answers might be, or where do you sense that, are there projects in the works, or are there people who are thinking oh, about these, and yeah. wh where do you think this conversation goes oh, now? The, yeah, there's a lot, and, and, and what's interesting, and this was, this was an aspect of uh, uh, the mimetic artifact that was unexpected, um, and uh, so I often refer to it as a gift. Um, the fact that I've been put into contact with so many people who are putting, um, as I like to say, really real time and talent and often their, their personal finances into trying to create ecologies of practices and communities uh, to home those practices and to provide a place of paradigmatic you know, guidance. So I, you know, I'm talking, uh, I'm regularly talking to people like Rafe Kelly and you know, he's, uh, he just uh, has done a retreat and um, I'm, I'm going to be also talking to some of his students one on one. And he's putting to get, you know, he's trying to get movement practices, like, you know, people who are like, so he's got expertise in parkour and he t teaches people how to go out and do parkour in nature and then move that with, integrate that with some uh, mindfulness practices and then integrate that with some meditative practices. And then you've got something like a circling practice. You sit around a campfire and then you talk and literally you know, it's like a primordial, <laughs> you know, campfire and you talk. And But he also has lectures where he then tries to integrate some of the cognitive science and some of the history from the series explicitly into all of this and so you know I'm talking with him uh, and he's put he just put out an online course now where he's trying to make it available uh, for people in general or I'm talking to Mike Nan he's he runs a dojo and he wants he's trying to put together we, we're meeting regularly and he's trying to put together the curriculum and he says I want to take this to adolescence I get th these kids coming into the dojo and so he does martial arts like in the comprehensive sense. It, it's not just a self-defense, it's a philosophy, right? It's a way of cultivating wisdom. And he says, I want to put together a curriculum, a course. I want to take this stuff you're doing, John, which is, you know, admittedly often very abstract. And how do we put it into sets of lectures, practices, exercises for these kids? So doing things like that. Or I get to meet... Right, I get to well, it's been on your channel. I get to meet people like Jordan Hall, and I, you know, and enter into this, you know, you know, regular. Oh, we've we've become friends, and entering like into these regular discussions about okay, what what do, he talks about, you know, game B, and I talk about trying to break out of uh, the cultural cognitive grammar we have and get a new one, and like what? Do, okay, let's stop. 
well, I'm never going to stop theorizing because I'm a scientist, but not, let's stop just theorizing and let's, what does it look like to try and do that? And so I've also met Guy Senstock, the guy who invented circling, right? And so we're, we're regularly getting together and, 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 and this is also because of, of, you mentioned him, Peter Lindbergh, right? It's like, okay, can we take these new emergent psychotech, and I'm really interested in Guy's work because, uh, and this is the thing that's very interesting to me, is because Guy has made it very clear, and he and I were in pretty much daily communication about you know the deep Heideggerian foundations, the deep existential foundations of circling, and so that's uh, because I think I see Heidegger as one of the main prophets of the meaning crisis and the problem of nihilism. So. There's somebody taking Heidegger, and Heidegger is not an easy read. Like, you, don't, you don't take Heidegger to the beach, right? And yet he's taking this very, you know, Heidegger is filled with neologisms and difficult, often turgid prose. And Guy has, tra has been translating that, you know, for decades now into this very successful practice for changing dialogue and discourse. So, you know, and, and, and so we're all talking together, and also my colleague, and co-author Christopher Master Piastro. So we're getting together, and it's very much this participant observation. Can we start to like re, is that the right word? I don't want to say re-engineer. Maybe it's just engineer. You know, a, 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 you know, psychotechnologies of communication that can, and this is something that I see emerging. It's on rebel wisdom, you know, the whole collective intelligence thing. Uh, what's the psych, what is the psychotechnology, or maybe I think a better term for that is Jordan's term, Jordan Hall's term, what's the meta-psychotechnology that will tap into the collective intelligence of distributed cognition and give us a, what's the word, a resource by which we can vet, which, by which we can shepherd, by which we coordinate all these emerging and ancient psychotechnologies of wisdom practice so that we can create something that's alive, that, that you know, that is self-organizing and self-correcting and self-transcending and can evolve with the rapidly changing nature of our increasingly complexifying society. So that's all what's really going on right now. And it's taking up a lot of my time, and, but that's not a complaint. I was surprised by how much, I, I was saying to my son the other day, I was like, this has become a job. Like, <laughs> like, I, I, like, like and so I'm, I, part of what I'm trying to figure out personally is, how do I integrate that with my job <laughs> as, you know, as, uh, as a professor at the University of Toronto? Uh, but that's, a, that's an interesting problem to have. Just to sort of zoom out a little bit, a lot of this is in, I think, the, the kind of cultural context that we're looking at, and certainly that I'm looking at, or that I'm bringing to it, is this sense of the new atheist hegemony, certainly culturally that I was aware of in the media and in the sort of wider, um, yeah, in the wider media landscape was sort of Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, scientific rationalism, and that seems to have been kind of broken, and we're now in a place, and I know that a lot of the people that we've had on our channel and that you've been talking to as well are looking at what the, the function that religions used to fill mm -hmm. and what now can go in that, into that hole. Yeah. What, I mean, that, that's the big question at the moment, I think, isn't it? I think so. I mean... I, I, I tread. The, I think this is the ground that needs to be tread, but I tread it very, very carefully, um, because, um, well, I'm in part of the part of the people I'm talking to, and that, and I'm benefiting immensely from the conversations are like people like Paul Vanderclay and Jonathan Pajot. He, he's uh, both of them have been on your channel, and um, because I see them, I mean, Jonathan, I think independently came to his, something very similar about zombies as you know, a, a mythic representation of the meaning crisis, and he and I have been in conversation, and, you know, and his work on symbolism, I think, is, is part of what you're talking about, like trying to understand the functionality of symbolism, and that's something that I do some work on. Um, and so I, I do think, hmm, I do think that what's needed is, again, I want to be very careful here, I don't want to be dismissive. I don't want to claim, I, here's what I don't want to claim. I don't want to claim that people in Christianity can't make Christianity work as a place where they can tap into the traditions, tap into an ecology, and cultivate wisdom and compassion. I think that would be a false claim. So I, I'm not trying to make that claim. But what I would say is I, I'm, I have suspicions 
I, I don't have conclusions, but I have suspicions that with the demise of what I call the axial age, that two worlds mythology, um, as a way of trying to understand, to articulate processes of self-transcendence and wisdom cultivation, as that two worlds mythology has collapsed under the weight of history and two worlds mythology meaning ah. the, the divine and the yeah, and sort the of the natural material. world and a base. Uh, uh, so the, the idea was and we've collapsed one into the scientific rationalist one. Yes, there's one flat world. land basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. So if you, if you think about what Charles Taylor's talked about in the Axial Age, we have the great disembedding. There was, there, there was sort of a, a unified, integrated cosmos um, and w in which there wasn't any sort of difference in degree between the divine. Uh, there's a tremendous difference in power, but there isn't difference in kind between sort of the divine realm and the human. There's, so it's, it's not paradoxical for the Pharaoh to be a god or for Hercules to become, you know, to ascend into God. Like, you know, there's... Um, but and what happens is, I argue that that's because what's what's going on there is this right what uh, is is a different understanding of wisdom than the one we have. It's a preaxial understanding in which the point of wisdom is to um, is to pick up on these these cycles and and this continuum and fit into it very well. But with the with the advent of a lot of psychotechnologies like. Uh, alphabetic literacy and, uh, and numeracy and, um, and other things like that, people get uh, a sort of metacogni metacognition is your awareness of your own cognition. They get, a, they get an enhanced metacognitive awareness of, uh, of, well, of the, what I was mentioning earlier, of the self-deceptive aspects of their own cognition. Mm. And, and, then, and then you get, you get this sort of double awareness our cognition is really beset by self-deception, but it's also really capable of self-transcendence because those two are interpenetrating. You can't have one without the other, right? And so the way to try and articulate that myth mythologically is, well, there's a lower world in which we're sort of encased in the illusion or the decadence, and then there's a other, better world where, where, where things really are and where we, where we can really be, and that the point of wisdom is not to fit into this world down here, but to somehow ascend Right? And, you, and there's all kinds of variations on that. And I see, I see a lot, and many of the world religions were born in that axial period, and, and, you know, and that's the heritage from which Christianity emerges. And I see, I see Christianity is still embedded with that fundamental grammar uh, that's got sort of solidified into the natural and the supernatural and things like that. Which, so, is, which is why you don't think like Jonathan uh, and... Paul, that, that Christianity can be the, the vehicle. They, they, because they effectively want to see Christianity kind of rebooted. Yeah. But you think that we've lost that grammar fundamentally, so we need something different. Is that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the gist of my argument. Now, I, I am being tentative about that. I didn't say that I don't think, I don't think, I, don't, I, I wouldn't regard that as a conclusive argument. Sure. I have suspicions that, right, that, like, I, you know, I, I, I want to say I'm impressed by what they're doing, and I want to keep watching, and I want to keep talking to them. Um, and I, want, I don't want to foreclose and say, no, it's impossible. So I'm not saying that. But what I say is I, I suspect that, we're, that Christianity is so bound to that grammar that as that grammar is being destroyed by these historical you know, forces, the history of philosophy, the advent of science, right? All of these things that have re-embedded us back into our bodies, back into the physical world, back into biological history. Like, we're deeply re-embedded now. And so I suspect that why many people are leaving, and the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, no organized religion, is, is, is an increasingly... Um, uh, growing, like it's not even growing, but the rate at which it's growing is growing, right? You know, it's, in, it's, it's getting larger and larger demographic group and it's going to become the dominant group in the society, right? So I'm, what I'm surmising is for many people, the, the, or, uh, the organized religions, because of the way they're bound to a grammar that just doesn't jive, um, that that's not an option for them. But as you said, and this is Nietzsche's point of the madman in the marketplace. You can't, like, just, like, trying to just, oh, well, no more God, right, right? The, 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 the tremendous functionality that, because what religion did, and this is one of Paul's great points, right, 
is, is religion does the kind of thing we're talking about here. It gives this comprehensive ecology and tradition and dynamic self-correcting, not perfectly self-correcting, but what is, you know, this process for giving people, you know, all of these psychotechnologies of self-transcendence and the cultivating of wisdom. And it did it in a way that was scalable, like for, you know, all aspects of society, right, and, you know, and, you know, also developmentally scalable. You could teach it to adults and you could teach it to children. And, like, and, and so it gave you this comprehensive way of intervening in people's consciousness and their cognition, right, and their character, right? And, and so you can't just sort of, oh, well, r r like just leave that space empty, and so what I argue is the attempts we made to replace that um, in the 20th century with totalitarian ideologies, what we'll create is our systems of ideas that totally will, will get that sort of totality of intervention. But if they didn't give totality of intervention. One of my critiques is the, these ideologies don't give people sets of practices other than political engagement or revolution or, or things like that. So the totalizing was just a totalization of belief and control. It wasn't actually giving what I would call like a comprehensive set of interventions. So the, the pseudo-religious totalitarian ideologies drenched the world in titanic blood because they, they kept promising uh, right, the, the secular equivalent of the other world, the upper world, the supernatural world, the, 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 the promised land, the, the forthcoming paradise. And not, and, but they couldn't actually deliver it because they couldn't actually promote the kind of transformation that I think is needed for addressing the perennial problems. So they, they get violent because I think there was sort of uh, frustration built into the, the heart of their machinery. Mm. And they drenched the world in blood. And they drenched the world in blood. So we're caught, we're, we're caught, we're caught between... For many of us, I don't want to say all of us, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be very respectful here, but for many of us, increasingly so, the, the nostalgic return to the existing religion is not an option. The pseudo-religious political ideologies are not an option. And so, almost in a Jungian sense, we're stuck. And so the idea is, well, we need, we need, something, like, we need something that's got the comprehensiveness, the scalability of religion, without right, get, pinging us back into uh, its, its code that doesn't work uh, in many ways, or um, become the, uh, I give a purely sort of political, sociopolitical um, ersatz surrogate for that. So that's what I call the religion of not religion. And this is the, this is the, the work that, uh, this is an aspect of my work that both Jordan Hall and Guy Senstock are very, uh, very interested in. I think people like Paul and Jonathan are interested in it, and I know they are because there's people in their audience that are, are commenting on this, like Mary Cohen and others, um, and they're very interested in it because they do take, I, I, ultimately they're going to disagree with it, of course, but I, I, they do think that this idea about getting really clear about the functionality of religion and that that's got to play an important part in responding to the meaning crisis, they take that very seriously, of which I'm very appreciative. Yeah, so this is really, really a focus on practice. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is sort of where you're now turning your energy to at the end of the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, like you're focusing very clearly on practice and the, um, the in particular, the sort of dialogic practices. Very much, very much. So, um, yeah, so what, I, what, what I'm doing is the follow-up series is called After Socrates, The Pursuit of Wisdom Through Authentic Dialogue. And the idea behind this is, and this was an idea that I uh, um, that was sparked in dialogue with Jordan Hall. So it, it's exemplifying the very thing I'm trying to uh, get a grip on. Um, which Jordan and I were talking. I think it was on one of the ones that's recorded for Rebel Wisdom. And I'm trying to understand his notion of coherence because uh, he's he uses it to extend, right? Um, and I'm trying to okay, I get that. I, and he and I'm trying to say, but. Like, can we create some sort of bridging term between that notion and what I'm talking about? Because I know he's very interested, and I, I, I'm grateful for that, very supportive of a lot of the vocabulary and the grammar that I've been introducing. Um, and so he, he said, well, uh, this is it. And he had one of those, one of his moments, the Jordanian moments, where he does that, that thing that's so wonderful. Um, and he said, 
What I'm talking about with coherence is a, is a meta-psychotechnology. And he said, you know, and it's a meta-psychotechnology because that will help to sort of shepherd, right, uh, you know, an ecology of psychotechnologies. Because I talk about that. What Part of the functionality of what religions did is they gave us, an, and I'm using the word ecology as a very strong analogy, right? The, the individual components are adapting, self-organizing like organisms, but they're also shaping a collective environment and a collective space in which there are checks and balances on the whole system. So that's what I mean by uh, an ecology. And he says, but you need something that sort of shepherds that because you're going to need to dispense with obsolete ones. You're going to need to engineer new ones. You're, no, you're going to need to you know, reorient um, them. And, uh, and he said, so you're going to need a metapsychotechnology. And I went, oh my gosh, yes. And then it, it, in my mind was ringing the idea, well, you, know, you need this metapsychotechnology for tapping into activating and accessing and accelerating and exapting, you know, the collective intelligence of distributed cognition. But that needs to be coordinated with, that needs to be coordinated with the metaheuristic of wisdom, which I'm talking a lot about right now. And remind me, I'd like to come back to that issue about, um, you know, sort of a broader notion of rationality of wisdom in, in, in the post-New Atheist world, because I think that's an important part of this. But... So you've got, and I, and I thought, okay, so that, and as soon as I put those two together in my mind, Jordan's notion of the metapsychotechnology, and and what, and the and you know this the term from the Berlin paradigm, some of the cognitive scientists who do work on wisdom, about wisdom as a meta heuristic. I thought, oh, that we had that in the ancient world, we had that in the ancient world. And what we, what we had, and you can see it exemplified in Socrates and in the Platonic dialogues, is we had dialectic. Don't hear that, don't hear that, Hegel, don't hear that through Hegelian ears. Um, there's a, uh, it, it, what I want to talk about is something that's in some sense a precursor to, to Hegel's dialectic, but it's much more, as you said, and this is crucially the difference, it's much more about practice. It's not about a sort of logic for understanding world history and translating that into political activism. That's not what I'm talking about. So what you, get, what you have in dialectic, right, which comes out of Socratic and Lenkis, is you've got this process by which these, and I'm, I'm, I, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm in the midst of doing this. It's like, so I'm, 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 I'm talking to people and I'm doing a lot of participant observation on one hand, and then doing a lot of research into, you know, Dan Sperber's work on the on how reason is probably uh, ultimately dialogical in nature, or how the way metacognition actually works, etc. So, but here are the dimensions. So, if you look at sort of dialectic, as it develops, especially into the Neoplatonic tradition, there's like a horizontal dimension, which is what you guys are exploring. It's like what happens when we get people. And instead of what Plato would call philia nikea, the pursuit of victory, they're actually doing philia sophia. What they want to do is they want to access the logos. They want to generate some emergent system between them that can tap into, your term, collective intelligence of distributed cognition and take, that, take us to places that we can't get to on our own. And then what's going on, right, if you've got all those dimensions, is you're getting something like a flow, a flow state in which all those dimensions are being optimized and coordinated when it's working. And so I'm trying to understand what are the dimensions, how are they working. And what I want to do is I want to get that, I, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do a historical and cognitive scientific analysis of what was going on in the ancient dialectic and then put it into dialogue, and that is not a pun, I mean that, put it into dialogue with all of these practices that are trying to access collective intelligence. And I'm trying to learn them from the inside as much as I can and see if we can engineer something that would do something like, something like, you know, take circling and bring, it in, bring into it something like philia sophia, like you see in the Platonic dialogues. We're, yeah, we're circling, but we're, we're, the, the point of the circling is not just the dialogue itself, not just the communing. It's also, yeah, but let's turn, what is wisdom? What is it? What is it? What, you know, what is courage? What is it? What is meaning? Like, bring it in to do that, right? And, 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 and so what, 
And so bring in like the circling, uh, bring in aspects of what I would call philia sophia, bring in some of you know what, what what you know what Peter Lindbergh talks about when he talks about the anti-debate about trying to recraft argumentation so we're not pursuing philia nokia, the love of victory, but so that we 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 can you know we can afford this collective flow that generates this emergent dynamical system, the logos that can be a place from which we can draw powerful insights so that we can start to get. You know, we don't have a good adjective for this. I want to say practical, but that's not the right word. But we, we can get really existentially, transformatively practical mm -hmm. advice and guidance on how to make psychotechnologies, how to shepherd them, everything that Jordan was proposing with the meta-psychotechnology. That's what I want to do with this series. The first half will be episodes on that historical cognitive scientific analysis of dialectic. The second half will be, you know, you know, uh, you know, talking to people, interviewing, participant observation, reporting on all of these emerging practices. Mm. How urgent a project are you feeling that this, this is at the moment? Well, there's two senses w in which it's urgent. One, I think, is, is Kairos. Um, and I hear so many people on your channel talking about that. And I take that very seriously. I, I, I agree with that. I, there's, there's a sense of a kairos here. There's a sense of a turning. And, 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 and there's a sense, almost a, like in the biblical sense of da'ath. We've got we've to get our sensibilities really finely attuned to this turning so that we don't screw it up and we get it right. right? And, and so I, I think um, that's why the, this project is very urgent for me because I want to try and help that turning. Right? But there's also I, this, the urgency. I take very seriously, um, you know, the fact that a lot of the things that are distressing, um, a lot of the things that have been indicated as markers of general systems collapse um, and civilization collapse are, are seem to be accelerating. You know, we have, I think we have just incontrovertible, incontrovertible evidence of ecological degradation, which is what you see when civilizations are, you know, close. Um, we, we definitely have, we have political ossification, stagnation, and inability for our institutions to solve our problems. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have a breakdown of a shared worldview. Uh, we, we have lots of indications that people are suffering existential and mental strain in ways that are accelerating. Um, a lot of the stuff I talk about in, in, in the symptomology of the meaning crisis. And that's all happening when, where we seem to, in, by many of, and this is, you know, Steven Pinker's thing, by many of the measures, we seem, to, we should be, he seems to be sort of, sort of like, why aren't you just, why aren't you just enjoying that we're, this is the golden time. We, we've never eradicated so much poverty in the world and reduced so much violence. And, but that's also a marker of a civilization that's about to tip. Um, and so all of these things, you know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe he's right, maybe the, his graphs will continue to go, right, but I don't think, I don't think, I, I, like, part of the thing that I've seen is just the, like, I, I, you know, Jordan Peterson and my work touched a nerve, and other people's work, there's a, you know, about the meaning, right, touched a nerve. Uh, I have so many people that write in and say, you're you're, you're putting into words what I've been going through for years. And, and, and they don't necessarily think, you know, agree with my, my response or anything, but it's just that, that there was something going on there. The same thing, I was at, I was at a live Q&A a, a couple of days ago, and people were coming up and, and you know, you, you have to take this properly, but people were saying, you know, you sort of saved my life or something. And, and, and I don't want to dismiss that. I, I, you don't want to, you don't want to, go the wrong way with it either. But what they're trying, what I believe they're trying to say is this, ha this is an urgent thing in my life and a life and a lot in the lives of a lot of people around me. And, you know, you're bringing it to articulation in a powerful way. So for, you know, I think I, I pay attention to all these signs and I pay both the positive and the negative. And like I say, the video that Chris and I did on the symptomology of the meaning crisis, we lay out that argument. I take that all very seriously. And I take the response that I'm getting to my work and to and related work. I take that all very seriously. So not only do I sense there's a kairos that we got to get right. I think there's a threat that's imminent, and if we don't do something about it, we're going to be overtaken by it. Given that sort of perspective, why do you think that this com this 
a particular piece about dialogue is the key um, response to that. If, if, we're, if we are threatened, why is that the right focus? So I, I, I want to be careful. I'm not claiming it's any kind of exclusive thing to do. Um, my, my way of, doing, of, 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 of explaining why I think it's how it could play an important role is that I think that we have overwhelming historical and increasingly scientific evidence that people will undergo the significant transformations that are needed in order to address major threats like this, right? They will take serious hits to their standards of living. They will take, they, they'll, 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 they're willing to undergo sort of significant political and socioeconomic experiment if they see lots of meaning making is going to come out of it. But if they're in a meaning famine and they're, and they're in a scarcity mentality of meaning, they ossify, they lose, they lose cognitive flexibility, they lose the capacity for insight, they lose the capacity for aspiration and transformation, and, right, and, the, and then they, they, they become, in a very important sense, rigid, and, and then they cling on to the other things that they would sacrifice if meaning was more apparent. So if, and I, and, and, yet, and you and I have been talking about this. We don't mean meaning like in the Hallmark card, oh, that's a wonderful meaning. We mean, you know, actual practices that will go into people's lives and give them responses to the perennial problems and facilitate them, you know, increasing their sense of connectedness to themselves, to each other in the world. That's what I mean when I say meaning. And if we can give that to people, I think then people are willing to go through the, 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 the changes and the sacrifices that are going to be needed to address these other problems. But that's, again, why we need the religion of no religion. We need, this can't be done on an individual ad hoc basis. That's why this, the, 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 collect, the, 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 the collective intelligence is where we're going to create the religion of no religion that gives people this meaning, right, and gives them the functionality that will do that comprehensive transformation of consciousness, cognition, character, and communitas that we're going to need if we're going to solve, to address these issues. So I don't think of it as, I wouldn't say like it's the sole locus, but I think if we don't get, if, if we don't address this, then pe people will, will not have the needed cognitive and existential resources to do what's going to be needed. We're, like, I, I see it in my son's, my older son's friends. It's like, they know that their standard of living isn't going to be, right? And they, and they see, and they're re, they are really worried that, they're, that the world is dying, and, 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 right? And they get all that. But yet, they're like, but they, they're, they're, I don't want to be insulting, but they're kind of Fragile because they don't have, they don't, for lack of a better word, they don't have a depth of wisdom, mm. right? So their lives are already so caught up with these unaddressed perennial problems that they have very little left over to address these looming existential threats that they can't avoid acknowledging. And so they're, they're often fragile, and I, I really, really feel for them in a profound way. Yeah, I find that the focus on transformative conversation to be really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's what, so from the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, I was sort of following, like initially the focus on Jordan Peterson, uh, and we've talked about this before, the, mm -hmm. like Jordan Peterson for me at, at his best with his lectures, there's a kind of sense of exploration and there's almost this sense of a dialogue with him, with the audience, even though it's a monologue, he's sort of, you don't know where he's gonna go and mm -hmm. there's an emergent quality to a lot of what he's saying. And then a, a sense with the intellectual dark web when it was first announced and framed was around, oh, these are people who uh, are going to have a conversation. They might change their minds. There's an aliveness. And there was some of that in some of the talks, but that was not really borne out. Like, I don't think we've had a public um, example of what that sort of transformative conversation really looks like where we go in and potentially change our minds. But how can people have these kind of genuinely transformative conversations? I think once you get a certain profile and you get identified with a certain position, it's much harder to do that. Um, for example, the new atheist position in Sam Harris. Yeah. But, but this is where I think a lot of our attention has gone to. It's like, 
what does a transformative conversation look like? How do we do it? And how can we get ourselves into that space? Because yeah. without it, I don't think we're going to get to the truth. I, I totally agree with that. Um, and, and part of it for me um, is, is that the, it, I, I, I would say it's something more than just a transformative conversation. That, that's what I'm trying to get at. Dialectic is bringing in sort of a bunch of different transformative psychotech where, where conversation is one of them, but they're being coordinated in, in, in a way. And so I'm really interested in that because I, one of the things I argue in the series is that the, 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 we've got to get below propositional knowing to the procedural and the perspectival and the, and the participatory if we're going to actually uh, get people to transform in the way they need to in order to meet uh, what Thomas uh, Bjorgman calls the metacrisis. Um, so I, I agree with all of that. Um, I, I, and part of, what I, part of what I'm excited about, um, well, I'm excited about the fact that, you know, like, I, sorry, it was recent and it, it had just a titanic impact on all of us. Like, was a, there was a four-way thing between Guy and Jordan and Christopher Master Pietro and myself. We recorded it, and we all came away from that saying, "Da, da." Like, like Jordan said, he was ringing and he had to have a nap, and, and Guy was just saying, "He said, you know, I hope I never recover from that conversation." What an amazingly beautiful thing to say! I hope I never recover from that conversation. And I just came, and I, I came, I had to do, I was supposed to be doing work after that, and I couldn't, I was, I was pacing around my apartment, I was like, oh my gosh, right? Because it, it, it was, we, we were not only talking, because I had framed the conversation, I want to talk about this project of dialectic, but I felt that at many points in that, that dialogue, we actually were exemplifying what I'm talking about. And, 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 if, and, 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 and it goes to the core of your thing. What we lost, you know, when we move from the Platonic dialogue to the Aristotelian monologue, we lost something. And I'm very well, well of that. I'm really well aware of that temptation. I'm a professor. I get to stand up and do the monologue, and I'm doing it in this series. But there was no monologue there at all. Like, and, and you know, and the, and the way, like, what was happening there, like, it was, it, in my opinion, it's the logos. There's this joint supervening authorship uh, that, that you're participating in. You're not just passively receiving, but you're not making, you, that's, it's, the, it's, it's participatory and transform, transformative in the participation. And so, just, that for me was proof of concept. That for me was proof of concept that this kind of thing is possible. We can move from a monologue to a dialogue, and the dialogue can be doing work. Like it's not just right. And, and, and it's fair to say this because Guy is responsive to this. He, I said, like I understand what circling does for people on its own, and I belong to a circling group now, and I value it. But, but it, I, 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 yeah. we need dialectic. Yeah, I agree. I think I think I I find it. A bit repetitive, especially as a film on YouTube, I found it a bit repetitive to just keep coming back to, okay, the nature of the present moment. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah. that's fine, but where's the content? Yes. Where's the, like, yes. that, that's something we're really exploring as well at the yeah. moment with, exactly. we're about to announce a whole, um, uh, we've done a collective intelligence series and we're about to announce an event where we're going to call it Impossible Conversations mm. and we're going to use sort of cir the circling modality and then introduce hot topics, hot cultural yes. topics into yeah. it. Yes. And then take people into like discussing gender or yeah. kind of a, a, a immigration or whatever, a topic that often will get heated. And then ask people to come out of that again, like almost like stop, come out and now talk about like what right. came up, what yes. happened. Yeah. So starting to get a kind of almost object relation to our own belief structures. Yes. Yes. Like realizing, okay, I realize like I'm holding that here, or I got yeah. much more upset than I expected to be, or whatever. Excellent. Um, so that, that's where... It sounds very similar to what yeah. I'm, I'm talking about. Very similar indeed. Yeah. Um, Introducing I, content to the kind of the right. we space practices, I suppose. Yes. Introducing content, uh, but also, yeah, uh, well, as long as we expand what we mean by content. I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in just generating more propositions. I'm, generating, yeah. I'm interested in generating insight, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that, um, like... Like again, this is why the template of the Socratic dialogues is so important to me. And very often, those dialogues will end. What's what's really important, and the work of like uh, you know Gonzalez on this, or especially Sarah Rapid's book on this, 
or Moore's book. On, oh, there's this renaissance of all this happening. Right, the the, the dialogues will often end when, uh, with Aporia. Like you know, I think it's the the Lysis where it's you know what's courage and you know he's and, and we all it goes all, all all through this and it ends and nobody and you, and if you just look at the propositions that look like well that was a waste of time, but what happens at the end of the you have to read you have to pay attention to the drama because the drama is where Pla that's what Plato is using to try and point to the collective intelligence. Because what happens in the drama is both the interlocutors with Socrates say, we want, we want our sons to come and, and spend time with you and learn courage from you. And you think, what, 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 what happened? Because Socrates wasn't able to produce a definition of courage. And what you do, and this is Drew Highland's point, and the whole, you go back and look what Socrates was doing He's exemplifying something that can't be captured in a definition. And so the self-awareness and the self-knowledge isn't just about, well, what are we doing right now in the present moment? It's like, oh, look, what we can do by coming into the present moment is we can discover how we're exemplifying the thing we're trying to understand. And that can give us a kind of deep participatory transformative insight into what it is. And that's where the recursivity of things like circling can become the self-awareness of exemplification. That's the kind of thing I, I see as a real possible. And that's what was happening in that four-way discussion. We were going, we would step back and we'd say something like, you know, what's going on and vulnerability. And what I say, okay, but I remember at one point I said, okay, but if we're trying to understand this, like, does it, can we, is there a way in which the world is vulnerable? Because like, and and guy, went, guy literally sort of shifted around in his chair. And he, whoa, because it was like, we're exemplifying this, but what does it mean? Let, not, let's not just note it, but what does it tell us about our attempts to connect to the world, about the phenomenology of our ontology? What does it tell us right now? We've got, we've got a moment here. We've got a moment. That's where, instead of just noting, right, and... and, and we, 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 can, we, can, we can actually do something like what was going on in dialectic. So you mentioned before that we might come back to rationality of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is part of my response to um, what you mentioned about the, the loss of the hegemony of, of the new atheists. Um, and, part of, and this is actually the, the series of videos that are coming out right now, the, 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 the section on sort of rationality and wisdom. And part of... Uh, Part of my critique of the new atheists is I think they have a very thin and truncated notion of rationality. Um, and I'm trying to get back to a notion of rationality that is clearly related, as it was in the ancient world, to wisdom. We should be cultivating our best wisdom and rationality as we come into these dialogues, and then those dialogues should be feeding back into taking us beyond where we can go on our own, which is central to culti the cultivation of wisdom. So I think those two, that's part of what I want to talk about, because that's, again, what I mean by dialectic. It's not, that's why, and sometimes I try to get a term, I'm, I'm sort of um, playing with the neologism of just using the, the ancient Greek as something that's beyond dialogue and dialectic. I sometimes call it dialogos, to emphasize the generation of the logos. And the logos is both something, like I said, that's, in the meta psychotechnology, but also something that I then internalize as I as I cultivate wisdom, and the two are just well, they're they're feeding into each other. So the new series after Socrates, mm -hmm. what do you hope to achieve through it? Do you? Do you I, I guess it sounds to me like you want to be kind of going on a bit of a journey yes. during it. So, Where do you hope to be at the end of the twenty episodes? So. I, my, one of my, the keystones of my pedagogy is to put myself onto a journey of learning and then share that, as opposed to just disseminating information. Um, and so that's where I think my best teaching happens. And, and I'm hoping, and, and this is not, again, this is something, that, this is something I'm aspiring to in, in Agnes Callard's sense, that I will be, in the sense of I'm going to be a different person at the end of this, uh, and um, I'm hoping that dialectic and the way I've tried to explain it will be, so first of all, personally, will be as central to 
my own spirituality, for lack of a better word, and I don't like that word, but uh, that, you know, meditation is, contemplation is, Tai Chi Chuan is, Lexio Divina is. And there's an important, that's going to be part of the series, there's an important thing between Lexio Divina as a style of reading and dialectic. That's also... Oh, Lexio Divina. Oh, so I talk about this in the series. Lexio Divina is a way of reading, and it's a... It's, it's, it's a it's a practice now I've been doing, I guess, for about a year, and I'm starting to get a sense of if, if its potential. Um, so when you read a text in Lexio Divina, and this is to try and get back to how we move to silent reading and we move to sort of propositional consumption is what we're doing with reading, was before that people are reading communally and they're reciting, and the point of the reading is to, uh, is to participate in an aspiration for transformation, right? And so what you do in Lexio Divina is you take a text um, and then you, 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 you read it aloud and then you basically um, go into something like a meditative state in which you're trying, the way I understand it, you, you're trying to let it resonate with you. That's what the tradition talks about. For me, what I do is I, I try and enact it. I try and, I, try and, I try and do the reverse of acceptation. I try to take this abstract things, right, and then the way, it, the way it's being expressed metaphorically and reverse it and actually embody it. So the Tao is, is, is like a well that's used but never used up. Well, what, would, what would it be like to actually be in that situation, engage that machinery, really let it resonate with you? I've just done Tai Chi Chuan, I'm reading this, and then I call up the imagery, like, you know, of, you know, and you can almost feel it, right? You can feel yourself, you know, the thirst, there's the well, I can go to it, and there's this inexhaustibleness to it, and I, it's, you know, okay, and then I'm feeling that, and, I'm, and then you do this thing where you try and embody it to the point where it can start to challenge you to transformation. And then you often offer, and if you were, like if you're a Christian, you would offer a prayer before, and then a prayer afterwards, if you're not a Christian, like, because this was also a Neoplatonic practice, independent, then what you do is, okay, what am I committing to? Like, what's coming out of this? There's an expression of gratitude and commitment. And so what you do, so you can see how it's, 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 it's again, it's got aspects of the dialectic, because what you're trying to get is, is very much like what you're getting in circling. You're trying to get a sense of a, of a presence between you and the text, that's emerging and calling you forth. There's a sense of being called, of, of hearkening, as Guy Sandstock says, right? So you're hearkening to the words, not just reading the words. And so Lectio, Lectio Divina is something I've been practicing, and I want to, and I, like I said, part of what I want to explore is how does that, right, come into, how does, it, how does it integrate with what we've been talking about under my term, dialectic? Um, so where I'll be personally is, I want to, how are all these things going to gel? Uh, because whenever I take up a new practice, right, uh, I, 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 it's not clear to me how, how the ecology is going to reconfigure around it. Um, and, I, so, and like I said, I, w- I want to see, and I, I want to help to try and create it. What does it look like, where, as you said, where we're doing content and not just, or I said, where the recursivity is ab- about exemplification and not just coming into the present moment. Right? All of that. Where I want, where I see this series doing is I'm hoping, I'm hoping I can do with after Socrates what people have said to me that I did with Awakening, mm. that I give a vocabulary and a grammar for helping people tap into this kairos that we were talking about. That's what I see for myself personally, and that's what I'd like to see the series doing, like interpersonally. Mm. Yeah, and I guess what I'd say as well is that what what where is the where is the interaction point between this which can be a little bit kind of abstract or a little bit um intellectual and the mainstream and for me that feels like it's around impossible conversations it's around difficult conversations becoming self-aware to how we are in conversation seems to be so there's been a few books out recently um peter bogosian and james Lindsay wrote how to have impossible conversations There's another couple of books coming out that I'm aware of uh, around the same thing, like how do you have difficult conversations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the only way, and that was actually one of my criticisms of their book, is that it didn't really go into the psychological and into the interpersonal anywhere near enough. It was more about kind of conversational techniques rather than becoming sort of deeply, deeply aware of what we're bringing and what we're, what's happening to us when we're in dialogue with others. But that feels absolutely essential as a kind of way through 
or a way of kind of defusing some of the worst aspects of the of the kind of polarization and the the um, the culture wars that we're that we're seeing is becoming much more aware of what we're bringing and what we're how we are in conversation. I agree with that. I mean, part of part of what I'm doing in in preparation is I'm going through a lot of the literature you referred to and like verbal aikido and you know uh, ver, you know and nonviolent communication and, and and trying to understand all of that. And, uh, and I, I do agree with you that part of what we have to facilitate is impossible conversation, but. There's different kinds of impossible conversations. There's impossible conversations because we come in with different commitments and values, mm. right? And, and I understand that, and, and I acknowledge that we need to bring something like dialectic to bear on that. But there's also other kinds of impossible conversations, whereas we're here, and how do we get there? It would, like what I talk about when, you know, when, when there's, a, there's a, some episodes in the series where I talk about that Gnostic sense of being entrapped in a world and you, could, you don't know how to get, you want to be there. The kind of thing that people experience in therapy when they're stuck and it's impossible, they know all the proper, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing this anymore, but they keep, and they're stuck and it, it's kind of an impossibility for them is how do I get over there? And part of what happens in therapy is another kind of impossible conversation where it's not that these people are coming in because they have conflicting values. It's like, we're here and we're stuck, and how do we get there? And I think that's another, port, import, another important kind of impossible conversation we need to learn how to have <clears throat> because we have to get to somewhere else than where we are. Part of it's going to be what you said. Part of it is like, okay, when we come in, we've got to somehow... It, it reminds me of like the two parts of Platonic and Anagogy. We've got to reduce the interpersonal conflict in some you know, some way that's affording, that, that, that right, that, that reestablishes the, the functionality. But we also have to learn how to take that and, and get to somewhere that we're not currently at. And that's another kind of impossible conversation. And I'm really interested in, in that one a lot. Because again, you see both of those in the Platonic dialogue. You see Socrates wrestling with people who are coming in with all these, you know, for lack of a better term, political and often self-serving agendas. And, but you also see the other thing, it's like, we need to get there as human beings from here and we're stuck and how do we get there? So I want, I want to address both of those kinds of impossible conversations. John, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.